Okay. One second. Okay. So I'm so really glad having this opportunity to talk to two authors that I've been following for years, and I'm really thrilled to ho to have the opportunity of hosting them on my show. And well, it started when I wrote a commentary under one of the mm, films you've made, and then I seen you complaining about no one really watching your show. I think it was not <laughs> true. It was like a few thousands of people already mm -hmm. back then. But I really like this smaller channels because it gives the opportunity of uh, the direct contact. Today, one of my favorite authors, analyzers, Rachel Wilson and Jamie Henshaw. Could you please, guys, introduce uh, you to our audience? Maybe some people are not knowing you. I hope some people from Poland are going to be introduced to your works, but could you please describe the other to our public? What you are doing? How could you... Should like, I go first and introduce me? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Well, the lovely lady here sharing the screen with me is Jamie Hanshaw. She is an author and researcher, and she is the author of Weird Stuff. Um, she also hosts a show on YouTube here, which is where um, I think we were discovered here to be on this channel and that is um out of this world with jamie hanshaw and we've done a few shows together um probably the britney spears series we did is pretty popular and we've done a couple other shows together as well so she's fantastic i like to call her a friend she i love her she's great <laughs> yeah, and I'm here with my good friend rachel wilson who is the author of occult feminism a really good book for anybody who um, is getting caught up in the men versus women uh, dichotomy. She has been on Tucker Carlson for this book, right? Yeah. She is um, probably one of the best commentators I know on issues that we have today. She has quickly... Um, become one of our favorite people to listen to. And she goes on uh, our friend uh, Church of the Eternal Logos, and she's been a returning guest on my show, Out of This World, and she's doing a – she's crushing it. <laughs> Yay, thank yeah. you. That makes me sound so cool. <laughs> and you are both cooperating with your sidekick husbands on their <laughs> channels also. <laughs> Yes. yes, my husband has a show. Uh, Jay Dyer is his name. His website, our website is uh, Jay's Analysis. And he appears on all sorts of uh, talk shows. He's going to be on Timcast this week. And Rachel's husband uh, does the show, the debate show. What is it called? It's Crucible? The Crucible, yes. Yeah. My husband owns a debate platform called The Crucible. Um, and he and I do debates together as a couple. Sometimes we will be on modern day debate this coming Thursday, the 19th. Okay. So and you, Jamie, are uh, the author of a book called uh, Hollywood Might Control, referring yeah. to the relationship between media and how it influences like the general culture. So this is, this are the scope of topics we're going to abort today. I want to talk about Hollywood but also about how uh, the culture changes in years. And the first thing I want to say is that we are all living in Hollywood. I already mentioned it when I've been talking with, I talked with a baselit analyzer that in Poland, everyone is to some extent living in USA because we are since the uh, childhood, childhood uh, permeated with all those pictures and stereotypes. And how do you see it? How differs life being presented in Netflix uh, from this one that you are really, really living in uh, your country. Is it faithful to the picture of life in USA? For example, the description of high school. Um, I didn't go to high school, so I can't comment on that. I was homeschooled, so Rachel can answer that. Is high school like it is in the movies? Um... I think to a large degree, it kind of is like, well, especially like the, the older movies, because I'm 42 years old. So the movies from like the eighties and nineties were similar. Like you do have your cliques 
like, you know, you got your cool kids and your nerdy kids and the jock sports kids and stuff like that. That is true to an extent. Um, but I think, I think the difference is that in Hollywood, everything is, whether it's intentional or not, would be uh, something Jamie would be more familiar with. But I think that it's kind of meant to program or convey certain ideas and kind of be used as propaganda in a way. So it is similar. Like American culture does, it definitely permeates most of the West. Like I would say most of the West is now very influenced by Hollywood, which is American but I'm not sure. I mean, it's, I think that they're somewhat accurate, but I think that there's a lot of stuff that is propagandized, but Jamie's, Jamie's kind of, that's her specialty. She's really good about that stuff. I feel like this is kind of art imitating life, imitating art with the high school because they try to exaggerate certain parts of the experience. You know, you've got your mean girls click, your jocks, your cheerleaders, your nerds, like you said, all of these um, separate groups, and then those groups are able to be um, manipulated a little bit nefariously because, like, uh, they're marketed to, you know, so you have your niches, and that's uh, another way of making money on uh, different aesthetics of high school, like uh, goth or uh, yeah. preppy. Yeah, like you've got all the stores in the mall for the different cliques, right? Like you've got mm -hmm. Hot Topic for the goth kids and you've got like Abercrombie and Fitch for the cool kids and things like that. You have your athletes. Um, so, yeah, I think that all goes into creating uh, archetypes and, and me making memes out of people almost. Yeah. And do you have this feeling – I? thought that I think that maybe in this older series there is only like two groups like these cool kids and nerds mm -hmm. and it reflects somehow this uh, like maybe ethnic to some extent uh, difference between this old Anglo-Saxon let's say elite and I don't know immigrants or some intellectual elite just nerds they think that this is like some foreshadowing of this bigger conflict inside the society like hmm. I kind of it kind of makes me think of Revenge of the Nerds, which I feel like it's one of those things that has kind of become reality <laughs> because now we've got like Elon Musk and Bill Gates and like people who would have been considered the nerds are some of the most powerful people who are really like calling the shots and buying up lots of farmland and doing all kinds of things that are influencing the entire world. So Maybe there is a little bit of that. But the funny thing is when you watch these people and especially like someone like Elon Musk, he you can tell he really just wants to be thought of as a cool guy. Totally. He wants to date <laughs> musicians. He wants to be in with Hollywood and with what is, you know, in and popular. So it's just a funny thing to watch somebody who has all of the money in the world. And maybe he got that way because of his high school experience. I'm thinking of like uh, Clueless. Remember that movie? That was a yeah. pretty, um, iconic movie. And there's a scene where she's uh, introducing the new girl to school because when you're new, you don't know when you where you fit in. So all of the groups are kind of sussing you out to see like where they can uh, stick you in. And she's giving the new girl a tour and she says, well, that's where the loadies hang out. You know, the kids who smoke weed. That's where the skaters hang out. That's where the, you know, preppy kids hang out. So, and there is a hierarchy, apparently. I did. I don't know. I didn't go to school, but like, you know, the, the cheerleader and the, you know, quarterback. Mm -hmm. I guess. And they are always the prom king and the prom queen and the most popular ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is some truth to that for sure. Um, I was always somebody that kind of had friends from all the different groups, but I'm kind of, a, my personality is kind of a weird mixture of things that doesn't go like directly into one group, but there were definitely like, I, my high school had kids that were even named like the stereotypes. 
Like, I don't want to say their names for obvious <laughs> reasons, but like the cheerleaders had cheerleader names and the nerdy kids had nerdy kid names. And even like the heavy kids had heavy kid names. And it, they're like, at least in my American small town high school, it definitely did fit some of the stereotypes. But I think there's like um, the, the thing that I think we do understand a bit as Americans is that once you get out of high school, that stuff, like if you were kind of relying on fitting into those stereotypes, that stuff doesn't really apply once you get out into the real world anymore. And then that can really mess with some people. So if you were really popular in high school and then you go off to like a big university, suddenly you're not the coolest kid on the campus anymore and nobody cares about you. And it's like, it can be a little bit of a mess with your head kind of a situation for people, I think. Is prom, for example, such a big thing as it's being presented in all those uh, TV series? Like it's this kind of uh, rit ritual of sort? Uh, I would say it is for the most part. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I think it depends how much money you have. So if you're uh, a poor kid, you just get the dress you can afford and you go and you have fun. But I think for like the more upper class kids or the kids who have a lot of money, Like I've seen where their parents will rent them a limousine and they'll go to like a five-star restaurant all together as a group beforehand. And then they go to the dance and then afterwards they might even get like hotels or things like for, for people who have money. Yeah. I'd say it can be like every bit as big and crazy as it is in the movies, but for people who are just like middle-class or less, probably not as much. Okay, many different fashions are coming to Poland from USA, and it's like this natural trend is in flux. So I want to ask you, what are we to expect here in Poland in uh, half of a year, for example? Because where some of things you are talking about are still not a thing in Poland, like for example, uh, OnlyFans. I don't think it's anything as for the moment. Uh, which nefarious fashions? Um, are popular in your country, which are kind of new and we can expect them to be across the ocean in a couple of months? Um, nefarious things? Um, what do you think? Well, I would say... Um, oh, okay, I got one after you. Go ahead. Okay. One thing I do, like, so I'm very interested to be on this show as well, just because... Um, You know, YouTube is so interesting. I watch a couple of like, I used to do hair and nails and stuff. So there's a nail lady that I watch who's Polish and she has a very popular channel, like a hundred thousand subscriber channel. Um, and I can tell just from like the aesthetics of her channel and like the fashion and stuff that there are some differences, but I think Poland has still got like a pretty, don't you guys still have a pretty big, Uh, more conservative Catholic nationalist uh, movement in Poland. So maybe the OnlyFans stuff isn't as accepted there. Would you say that's correct? <clears throat> This is relatively conservative cons uh, compared with other countries of Europe. But for example, our government is just de declaring these kind of values, but it's not like in fact really representing them. But okay. anyway, I think that this country is just kind of reserve, ref, refuge for uh, many different traditional uh, values in Europe. It's very different than, for example, France or Germany compared. But, well, we are, on the other hand, on the very strong inf influence of USA. Like, people in Poland are just in love with USA and everything coming from uh, from that um, the place, like the contrast with... Uh, Germany or, or Russia. Therefore, well, this is like uh, a little conflict because uh, like the embassy of USA is promoting other things and people are in general just leaning toward other. Okay, so um, I think this is interesting to compare when I'm listening to your uh, show, you present like this um, culture being like in the future com concerning us. You We're referring to, for example, this OnlyFans, like it's very important thing. You gave this average price they earn for this um, activity. How do you understand the role of this? Like, th is this like 
and this prolongation of feminist agenda? Well, I think it's a couple of things. It's definitely it's definitely related to feminism because it's presented as um, it's it's kind of presented to young girls this way. Look, you have all of this power because of your sexuality, right? Well, rather than let the evil bad men exploit it, you can be in control, right? And you can be in charge of putting your sexual imagery out there and getting money for it, which makes you a boss and makes you in charge. It, it puts you in power. It's empowering. So it's always sold to young women as like empowerment, even though this means there's going to be pictures of you nude that are going to be out there or videos of you doing Lord knows what out there forever. And that you, it, it, it gives them this illusion that they are in control of that and that they can profit from it in a way that's safe when I don't think that's the case at all. Um, in fact, I think it's more exploitative, but it's sold ironically as something that's empowering. So um, it is very popular here. Unfortunately, I wish that it wasn't. I have two daughters who are 22 and 20 and they have, they're constantly having to talk their friends out of starting an OnlyFans because they they think they're going to make like thousands of dollars if they start one of these things, which if you guys don't know in Poland, it's basically a website where you can sell risque or even pornographic material of yourself on your own like little website, kind of like YouTube, but for pornographic type of stuff. You can do other things, but that's what 98% of OnlyFans is. It's pornographic material. So it's sold to young women as this empowering thing. But I think it's actually very exploitative because I think the average girl makes like $126 a month off of it, which in America, you can't even pay like your phone bill with that. So it's it's actually not much money at all that the average because girl makes. Here in Poland, we are on the face of Instagram. It's like mm -hmm. think that people are posting their uh, pictures for free, as for the moment. But in <clears throat> some, months. but it's not like you can live yourself out of what you're earning. It's like a thousand of dollars, right? And unfortunately, um, I thought of two things that could be coming to a country near you. A first one, and Rachel and I just did a show about this. The last one we did was um, about the Balenciaga scandal. Mm -hmm. And I think witchcraft is going to be very uh, trendy. Yeah. Um, and it's not going to diminish in the future. I think it's just going to get more and more traction. Uh, they've already been producing a lot of witchy things for children. Um, Disney has a whole slew of occult witchcraft. Uh, cartoons and then you've got Sabrina the Teenage Witch and I mean you can just think of any there's there's too many examples to name um, so witchcraft is going to be big so look for like you know the the dark aesthetic that goes along with that um, they like to play that up you know maybe even down to pointy hats I don't know that could be like a fashion thing um, I'm serious though but mm -hmm. the next thing mm -hmm. after witchcraft is going to be synthetic partners. So um, yeah. I do give a talk um, about the the AI um, coupling, you know, uh, robo wives and, and robot husbands is going to be maybe within the next 10 years trying to be normalized. And the people who can't afford a full on AI internet robot companion will probably start um, by using dolls, things like that, real dolls. And does it really start it already in USA? Uh, the movies are starting to insert the idea that this could be a, you know, um, a good idea for neurodivergent people. Yes. In fact, yeah. Britney Spears' husband is starring in this. It's like an interactive movie almost. It's like an app where he is supposed to be like a programmable AI boyfriend, which um, I think it's so interesting that he has been chosen for the face of this specifically. But yes, this is, it's starting to, so in the United States, I don't know if you guys have this 
in Poland, but we have something called the incel problem and it's involuntarily celibate men. So since we have feminism, since we have only fans, since we have like a, a lot of our pop stars and our like hip hop stars are these really empowered kind of strong masculine boss women who are very hypersexualized. Um, and then we've got, you know, so much pornography, only fans, Instagram, a lot of men are just not dating. They're just staying home and sending money to girls on the internet. Like I'll just, I'll just send $10 to my favorite hot tub girl or my favorite only fans girl, you know, I'll just send her money. And it, it kind of works as like a pseudo relationship where they don't have to uh, risk rejection. They don't have to deal with actual dating. They don't have to get married or any of that. You just have kind of a virtual relationship. And I think what Jamie's talking about is that the next logical step there is AI or robotic boyfriends and girlfriends as a, as like an answer to the problem between the sexes that feminism has kind of proposed that men and women are at odds, that men are going to exploit and abuse women and women are going to leave you and divorce you and take half your stuff. Right. So this is um, a problem they've created and now they're going to solve it with robots and AI and OnlyFans and these sort of replacements for relationship. And it is becoming something that's at least the concept here is popular. It's not like we have widespread robot boyfriends <laughs> or girlfriends <laughs> in America yet, but it's being yeah. it is being definitely promoted. So there's multiple TV shows, movies, video games things like that, that are putting the concept out there to make it acceptable and make it seem like a viable alternative. So I would, I would totally agree with her that that's probably the next step. And then witchcraft. I don't know if you guys have a lot of that there now, but it's the fastest growing religion in the UK mm -hmm. and it's very popular here. Um, and they try to make it sound more like, Oh, it's just nature worship or it's just, um, you know, the divine feminine or, you know, they try to make it sound very uh, innocuous and, and kind of cute. And there's like an aesthetic, like, oh, I just love plants and crystals and, um, you know, like tarot cards are pretty, like all the designs on them and stuff. So um, I think witchcraft is super appealing right now, as she said, too. And like with Balenciaga and major fashion brands latching on to that and then marketing products that have a witchy aesthetic to them. <clears throat> I must admit that now being with my family in a remote village in the like outback of Poland, I'm I'm noticing that this is a very huge change between the generations. Like the younger female members of family are prone to magic. Like the horoscopes and things like this are a great deal for them. And it's not the case of a mother, for example. And then she, for her, this is kind of uh, stupid stuff. And well, I see that they treat it with a very great respect, and they really obey to the rules being given by this horoscope. And there is a lot also of newspapers with uh, magic, like the promo promoting magic. And well, this is on the rise, and I think, um, well, it's. Like in your country, you observe it's this Wicca thing, for example. Is it really that serious? You mentioned it many times during your conversation because this is also not a thing as for the moment here in Poland. Is it, is it like popular? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very popular. Um, like I said, my younger daughters, most of their friends have like, they like to hang canopies like on their bedroom wall that have like a uh, witchcraft symbolism or like a Kabbalah tree, the tree of life, things like that. If you go into a lot of the stores in the mall, there's uh, there's like popular books for how to get started with Wicca or witchcraft. There's, um, you know, crystal lamps are really popular and things like that. So it's it has gotten to be like I, I don't think most of them think it's a serious religion. But whether they know it or not, they are participating anyway, if that makes sense. Uh, not so long ago, you would have to go to a specialized occult bookstore to find books on 
<clears throat> witchcraft, magic, conspiracies, you know, those type of books, like your big booksellers, like Barnes and Noble, Wallen books, what you would find in the mall or, um, you know, at the shopping center. Their witchcraft occult section would be very small, uh, a couple shelves. But now, and this was just maybe like 10 years ago, we'd have to go to the designated, you know, occult bookstore. But now, like even the big chain booksellers, um, maybe a quarter of their stuff is occultic. Even the novel, the young adult novels now have different subgenres like um, paranormal romance, paranormal teen romance. Yeah. So uh, they're getting the kids used to uh, being comfortable with the idea of communicating with spirits, of having relationships with ghoulies and monsters and vampires and beasts and all kinds of gross things. Oh, yeah. And you can see that, too, in, like, the the movie franchise Twilight here was really popular. Before that, it was, like, Interview with the Vampire, which really romanticized, like, vampires and occult kind of things. And so I think, it, and the music, too. Tons of it in the music. I mean, pop music has more occult symbolism. Like, Jamie's done some really great shows about you know, some of the Super Bowls and different pop stars or hip hop stars who are using occult symbolism all the time. And it's not even, it used to be more subtle, but now it's pretty in your face and it's pretty um, acceptable. And I think that has happened at the same time that like, because we are a mostly Protestant country where you have, so like in my area, um, I'm in a region of the United States that is predominantly Protestant. We don't have much Catholicism and we have even less Orthodoxy. We have just in my little area, there's like a Seventh-day Adventist church, a Baptist church, a Lutheran church, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. We have a Christian science church. We have a Scientology place. There's like thousands of different types of Protestant Christianity and they're all on the decline because they are all so atomized and they're all so, um, it, you know what I mean? Like everybody just, each church has like 20 families and that's about it. There's no unity at all, like for Christian Protestants in the United States. So we've seen Christianity kind of decline and then something has to replace that, right? Because people are spiritual. And since we have a predominantly feminist ethos, goddess worship and witchcraft is a very like logical rational replacement for that because it has a place for like the divine feminine and for worship of women and women's sexuality and fertility and things like that so um the occult in general is becoming really popular but because i think we're such a feminist society that the goddess worship witchcraft stuff is really appealing especially when young women go off to college you know they they leave their like bible church behind and they go off to college and then they're they find out about like wicca or something and they're like oh i'm a green witch and it just means that i love nature and plants and crystals and it seems very benign. It seems pretty harmless to them. And it gives them like a place to put the feminist stuff that makes sense on a spiritual level to them. Okay. So there, there are a few topics I want to abort, but just a small question because you are living in like two separate, separate parts of the country. Like uh, you, Jamie are from Tennessee and it's concerned as uh, deep South or, or South. And you are from Wisconsin, this lake country, and this is uh, related to this nor northern, I don't know, mm -hmm. it's it's not New England, but uh, do right. you think that this difference is still real, like this cultural difference? Uh, how do you perceive it? Yeah, what do you think? Um, well, a lot of things that people, I mean, a lot of Europeans don't realize how big America is. I mean, it is immensely huge so even from state to state you get a vastly different culture it feels different the people act different they have different values from region to region um, and the art that is exported is you know what we would call mainstream uh hollywood able to get a lot of places but then the local art doesn't get anywhere so it's it's a uh, 
not unfair, but it, it is kind of unfair that Americans get judged artistically by Hollywood. Yeah, I would agree. Because we're not all like that. Um, we produce way more, uh, you know, thought provoking and, and beauty and uh, originality than what Hollywood would export. Yeah, I, right? I would totally agree with that. And where I am, so just in my state alone, if you take the biggest city in my state and compare it to where I am, which I'm like you, I'm out in a rural area in a very, very tiny like farming town. It is different here than it is in the big city. Very different values, very different culture. However, I have seen that since social media has become so popular, it has affected the rural areas a lot more. So like 10 years ago where I was, you didn't have a lot of like LGBT stuff. You didn't have um, a lot of the like the more progressive elements of American society. It was much more conservative. It was very religious. Um, and in fact, the Midwest, the rural areas have a lot in common with like the deep south in uh, America. Whereas if you go to the bigger cities like Chicago or Detroit, it's urban and it's very progressive. It's very like humanist and very liberal. <clears throat> um, but that stuff has started to really seep into our smaller towns here now that social media is so popular because every kid has a phone and they're seeing, you know, all the same stuff that everyone else is seeing. So even in my little tiny small town that used to be very conservative, it's like half of my younger kids' friends think that they are gay or bisexual or trans or something now. It's, I mean, it's most of them, unfortunately. And that's, like, it, um, that's, at least for me, what I've seen in my area, that's been the biggest change in the last 10 years. Do you exaggerate or this is like really that bad? <clears throat> For my kids, and again, I'm in like a conservative rural area, half of their friends think they are bisexual, transgender, some kind of LGBT identity. And when I talk to the kids and ask them what they think that means, they don't have, now my younger kids are like 10 and 13. So these are kids between 10 and 13. And they think, so one of them said, oh, I'm bisexual. And I said, oh. What, is, what does that mean to you when you say that? And she said, it means I love all my friends, regardless of who they are. So she doesn't even truly understand what it would mean to say she's bisexual. She's just had so much propaganda that she thinks it's like, it means I'm kind and tolerant and loving, right? So this is how... Uh, this is how the propaganda sneaks in there and changes people's perception of things. And I don't know what will happen when these kids get to high school and college age, like what that's going to do. But it's it's a huge change from what it was like 10 years ago in the area I am. Because you, before you'd have certain districts that voted on things and, you know, your PTA and your people would get together and make decisions based on their values of their community. Mm -hmm. But like she said, even within the last 10 years, it's become way more homogenized. And what the people actually want in their community is being ignored in lieu of the agenda. Yeah. Me coming from this like uh, biology, ecology, media, trying to uh, rethink it in this conservative way, uh, I, I think that this is kind of a parallel, we can call it as uh, cultural in eutrophization. So like um, the easier is the access to culture, like this pulp culture, uh, the, most, the more homogeneous it's all getting with, with time passing, like this original difference are going to uh, disappear with time. Okay, so let's abort uh, feminism for a while be before we are going to go back to pop culture. So do you think that in last, let's say, 200 years, the situation of women in society uh, is getting worse or better? Would you rather prefer to live in the past, like, for example, in 19th century, or do you think that it's better now? Not regarding. Uh, I think this, maybe we like, should go first. <laughs> um, I think we peaked like maybe in the 90s or the 2000s. 
Um, I think maybe that was before everything started to get really crazy. I wouldn't want to live in the past. Um, I don't romanticize the past and all of it. It's things that had to be overcome that we just don't even think about anymore. Right. Um, we take a lot of things for granted in modernity. Uh, but I, I do feel like it, it reached some kind of, you know, point and now it's like going, to, what do you think, Rachel? Yeah, I would say, um, and this is a really common misconception because if you guys are not familiar with what I do, I talk a lot about feminism and, um, there's this tendency to assume that if you don't like where modern feminism has taken us, that that means you want to go back. That's not, for one thing, you can't, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, right? But the other thing is, um, part of the reason that feminism did not spread throughout the world until the last hundred years is because it took a technological revolution to make that happen. So once most tasks around the home could be mechanized. You have like laundry machines, dishwashers. Um, you had the industrial revolution where women could go work like a, a unskilled labor factory job, but actually make some money at it. That's when it gave feminism this opportunity to become the dominant force in the culture. And the problem is that it, the problem is not that women have more choices or that women can do things that they didn't used to do because they have more time. Like me, for instance, I have five children and I'm a housewife, but I do have time to do stuff like this because I have a laundry machine and I've got a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have a car, I've got grocery stores, you know what I mean? I don't have to um, do homesteading and farming. I don't have to do a lot of like manual labor like I would have had to 200 years ago. So I do have more choices. But the problem has become that we have pitted the sexes against each other. We've told women that men are untrustworthy and that men's natural inclination is to abuse and exploit you and that they can't be trusted. And then we've told men <clears throat> that women's natural proclivity is to take advantage of them, use them as ATM machines, um, get married and take half of your stuff in the divorce, right? So we've pitted the sexes against each other and made them made them wary of each other and made them feel like they're on opposite teams that have to fight each other. And I think that's where the problem comes in. And that was not, that part of it was done partially on purpose by um, transnational corporate elites who thought it would be great to get a lot of women into the workforce for cheap because a hundred years ago, that's what they did. They could get women to work for cheap. And actually a lot of them still do. If you look at the average woman in America, what she makes, it's not that good. Um, and then the government liked it because it doubled the tax base, right? If you get all the women out of the home working, you get double the taxes. And then you also get the added benefit of if mom and dad are not at home raising the kids, then all the kids end up in the public school system where they can be indoctrinated with whatever the government wants to tell them. So it's, it's not that women being able to do other things outside of domestic work is a bad thing. It's that that was used by the powers that be to atomize and destroy the family and to influence the sexes to like be at odds with each other rather than come together and have healthy families. Okay, <clears throat> so what do you um, concern as the biggest lie of feminism? You already mentioned, but maybe what are the false promises of feminism being given to women? Sorry, I had to use my inhaler. <laughs> I have asthma. Well, the false promise of feminism, um, I would say, so everything feminism was supposed to do the way that they sold it to women. It was supposed to protect us from bad men. It was supposed to um, give us freedom and liberty. And it was supposed to, um, it was supposed to make families safer, right? Because the thing that they always used to scare women, and it's not that this isn't true. There are bad men. There are abusive men in the world. But there's no system that eliminates that, right? There's no system, political system, that's going to eliminate evil or people being bad to each other. But feminism was sold as women 
this way. It was like, well, what if you get married and your husband turns out to be abusive? Then you won't have money. You won't have a choice. You'll be trapped and it's going to be terrible for you. But the problem that we see in the last chapter of my book, I cite a whole bunch of statistics which explain that actually feminism has left women more vulnerable than ever to things like abuse and exploitation because you remove fathers from the home. So girls grow up without dads to protect them and then they get to be adults and they don't want to get married. So they don't have husbands who actually care about them and protect them either. They're just out in the world on their own, but they still end up oftentimes having children. And then those children don't have dads or grandfathers or men around to protect them. And that is very attractive to predators. People who do want to prey on children or vulnerable women tend to come into the picture. And what we've seen is rates of child abuse have gone much higher. We didn't have great statistics on things like domestic abuse for a long time, and we still don't because a lot of it goes unreported. But we do have some pretty reliable statistics about child abuse. And we do know that when people come into the home that are not the biological parents, so it could be mom's boyfriend, dad's girlfriend, uh, maybe mom has decided that she's a lesbian now and she's going to have her girlfriend move in. When we see uh, other adults come into the home who are not the biological parents, the instance of abuse goes up, the severity of the abuse goes up. And um, it leaves children extremely vulnerable. And it hasn't protected women financially. Women are now the majority holders of debt in this country. In the United States, women hold two-thirds of all college debt with an average of $36,000 in debt from going to college. And the average woman in America makes about $40,000 a year. So if you have to pay a $300 a month student loan debt and you're paying half of what you make to child care and you don't have a husband, you are left extremely vulnerable in every way that you can imagine to bad people, to predatory men, to financial ruin. Um, you're just one paycheck away from disaster. And so I think the biggest lie of feminism is that it told women it would protect them and it's actually made them much more vulnerable and it's made society as a whole very vulnerable. I think that's how you have things like the transgender movement happening. I don't think you could have that if you still had virtuous patriarchs, fathers, grandfathers in the picture all the time. I don't think it would have taken off the way that it has. I think feminism lies to women in the way that it, well, one of the tenets, I guess, is that they can operate in a promiscuous way and somehow this is supposed to be empowering. Um, so it's kind of like, I, I don't, she, you know more about like classical feminism than me, but the idea that I get from feminists when they talk is like, you can uh, beat men at their own game by just not getting married and being promiscuous and having as much sex as you want. Um, and somehow this isn't going to affect you at all. Um, so I think it, it's just like a very empty way to live for women especially. And it would just make you more lonely in the end trying to have a sex life that is equal to, you know, a F-U-C-K boy or something like that. Like I'm thinking of Sex in the City. Yeah, definitely. that show where, you know, we can beat the men at their own game if we just don't, if we don't have any love or and we just treat it like another bodily function or uh, just another pleasure hole to fulfill. Yep. Totally agree with that. I wanted to ask in particular about this show, Sex and the City, how big it was and how strong was the influence? Um, yeah, how big the changes that it made at the time? I think it was huge. I think it impacted fashion. I don't think anyone knew who the designers were, like of shoes, you know, M Manolo Blahnik or yep. Chimmy Choos or anything like that. So it put a lot of these big fashion houses um, in the everyday vocabulary because it was, you know, on HBO is such a big show. Um, and then so one of our shows about Balenciaga, we were talking about all these, you know, fashion houses and how they're connected to witchcraft and occult and other gross things. 
not all of them, but many, most, like just the yeah. biggest ones, Chanel and uh, uh, what was the other one? Pretty, pretty much all of them I can think of. What's the one with the, the Ital Gucci? Oh, Gucci. Gucci's yeah. Another oh. big one. And then the Gucci heiress came out and said that she was essayed and she's going to have a forthcoming, you know, tell all about everything that happened to her and her family. So, yeah. Yeah. That's completely spot on what Jamie said. And like in the late nineties, early two thousands, there were t-shirts in every single store that would say things like, I'm a Samantha or, um, you know, like the different character names. I'm a Miranda. And they kind of became new character archetypes. And I think it perpetuated this idea that you can remain single and sexy forever. Um, and that's another thing I try to warn young women about is that do not build your life around your sexuality, around your sexual attractiveness, because that is temporary. It's a temporary part of your life. You don't want to be Madonna and be trying to be a sexy grandma when you're 70 because you look ridiculous. She looks ridiculous, you know. It's yeah. a very empty, like Jamie said, it's a really empty, kind of depressing thing. And in our country, in America now, 25% of all adult women have some kind of mental health diagnosis that they take a prescription medication for. That's a quarter of our women are on some kind of uh, psychotropic drug for some kind of mental illness. It's weird though, because like we live in a very small town and there are no rainbow flags anywhere. And so your average American and their experience is way different than what you see on television. And it's weird because it's almost like we put our worst foot forward. Yeah. It, you know? Yeah. And I think it's because it's been so effective here. This propaganda has been so effective in the United States that they definitely do want to export it to the rest of the world. I think that they would like these kind of effects in the rest of the world as well. And it's like America was kind of like the, the test, the pilot. It was like the test area and they want to export it everywhere mm -hmm. and make this kind of stuff popular everywhere. And I don't know how it's going in Poland, but here we are well below replacement on our birth rate mm -hmm. because of birth control, because of, um, you know, people just aren't getting married. People just aren't having babies. We've convinced women that they have to have careers and that's it. Right. So it's like it's very helpful for people who would like to depopulate um, and then as Jamie mentioned, like the whole, uh, robot thing, the sex bot thing, that kind of stuff, it's all, it's like, it's all leading to a kind of transhumanist agenda where they want a much smaller population that they have a lot of control over. And then, um, whoever, you know, whoever you think the transnational elites are have control over all the resources. So I think, this kind of propaganda is very useful for social engineering and control. Um, and unfortunately, it's been very successful here. So I do think they're going to try to push it elsewhere. But Jamie's right. There's places in the country that are not like this. And it, for me, I've always seen the dividing line to be like urban versus rural or like small mm -hmm. towns versus big cities. And if you look at America, all of our big cities are mostly on the coastlines. So you're getting like the Hollywood, California version of America, or maybe the New York, New England version of America. And then the whole center of the country is more family oriented, more um, less accepting of like LGBTQ stuff, less accepting of progressivism in general. Um, like where I live, it's very common for people to keep chickens, shoot guns, um, homeschool their kids, things like that. It's not as strange where I am. It's creeping in for sure, but it's, they are different cultures. And I think that the coastal elites are the ones that, like she said, they export our worst aspects of our pop culture to the rest of the world. It's quite stunning because I'm observing uh, this uh, very popular dialectic between um, like rural USA and city dwellers. And this is kind of like catabasis when the city dweller is going 
to the to this r- rural area, to the little town or the village, like Harry Angel or maybe even Twin Peaks. And this is kind of a hellscape there. Uh, every pathology is just lingering there uh, in the outskirts of civilization. Um, is it really like this? Uh, well, I, I don't mean that it's like uh, this in reality, but how do you see this kind of propaganda operating? Well, now we're in the destruction phase of the alchemical process. So the cities she was talking about are called port cities. And we were just listening to this um, conspiracy tapes called the Dr. Day tapes. And this was made in the 60s. And he's talking about the plan that they put their liberalism, their Marxism, their uh, weird ideals into port cities, namely New York City, Seattle, and San Francisco. <clears throat> and these are exactly the cities that are crumbling now because of their policies and their homelessness and their drugs and just all of this crazy uh, laws that they implement. And so going to San Francisco maybe like 15, 10, 15 years ago was beautiful. And now it's like you said, it's a hellscape, literally. Yeah. I mean, needles on the ground, people pooping on the sidewalk, tent cities, Los Angeles, tent cities. Last time we went to Austin, there was not one underpass freeway that didn't have a tent encampment underneath it. I haven't been in a couple of years, but all the big cities are crumbling and it's really sad to watch like our treasures of culture just be swept away with this liberal ideologies. Yeah. The difference I see, for example, is like here in the village I'm now, uh, the discapacitated people like with Down syndrome or with memory loss can just uh, randomly roam all over the place, come to the neighbor, talk to them, and they are always in this kind of safe space. And the big city is the very different thing because people are uh, anonymous to one, one another. This is like this uh, alien lands- landscape much more dangerous, in fact, but it's depicting other way around in the shows. And it always puzzled me to see like yes. this rural area. This is like contraintuitive. I know what you're talking about. They always try to make people from the South look stupid. Yeah. And they always try to make anything outside the city is dangerous. And that's a trope in a lot of horror movies. Like, why did we yes. even leave, leave the city? We're going to get murdered in the woods. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's so much safer out here. I mean, we went on vacation for a week and we had packages delivered to the house and sit on the porch for more than a week and nobody touched it. Like we don't worry about things outside. Yeah, yeah it's like that here where I am too. Um, and I, so me being out in the country and everything, I will have people, cause it's probably, it's probably a 40 minute drive from my house to like a mid-sized city, not even like a big city, but like a middle-sized city. Big cities are about two and a half hours from me if you're driving. And I've had people who are like city friends say they're nervous to come out to my house. And I'm like, why? And they're like, well, it's scary out there. Like what if a bear gets me or like, you know, all the creepy people that live out in the woods and It's the opposite. Like Jamie said, it's really safe here. And I get nervous if I have to go to the city. I want to bring like a handgun. But of course, there you can't have one. So the first time I ever had a panic attack was in New York City. And I had been to I had been a world traveler, been to many capitals uh, and cities all across the globe. And it was it wasn't Times Square, but it was like that. And I was getting like uh, overwhelmed and panicky and just the. Um, the visuals and the lights and the honking and the people, it was, it, it felt like techno Babylon is what I described it as when that happened. Yeah. I, I get that way. If I have to go to Chicago, I get very nervous. Cause I feel like if anything happened, like if there was a disaster or an emergency, I feel like I'd be stuck and wouldn't be able to get out. So I don't know. It's a, I guess it's just different. I've been, I was raised out here. So I've never been, I've lived in cities for short periods, but I don't like it. So (laughs) I'm not used to it. But you, Jamie, actually, you did live in, you lived in uh, California for a while. Yeah, I grew up in California. So I lived there for almost 30 years. And Southern California is kind of like a one big city. 
there is no uh, in between towns. So yeah. it, it it's like a stitch of medium sized towns that never ends. Yeah. So until you get to maybe like Los Angeles or San Diego where they have skyscrapers, but that's its own little culture, I guess. It, it's not like a big city. Um, yeah. It's what they call sprawl. Yeah. Urban sprawl. Yeah. That's where my husband grew up too. So that's so more you, what he's used to. You have all the crime, but not as much of the art <laughs> museums and, uh, you know, concert halls and, and, things that you associate with fine culture and high uh, art and things like that. But we have our own. Something that's funny um, I always think about is uh, in Nashville and Tennessee, we have the Opry instead of the opera. Yeah. So you have to kind of understand how Southerners think and, and how um, there's just not a lot of pretense and there's not a lot of snob snobism. Is that even a word? Yeah. Uh, they're very real and they're very like, we don't need, if if you're going to act like we're beneath you, then we'll make our own thing and it'll be awesome. Yeah. We'll have Dolly Parton and we'll have Graceland and we'll have, yeah. <laughs> we'll have Elvis. We'll have all these things. We don't need like Carnegie mm -hmm. Hall if you're going to look down on us. Yeah. We make our own art. But do you feel alien being from California and then going to the South? Not so much because California is such a melting pot. It kind of trains you to blend like a chameleon. You blend in um, wherever you go. And the lack of accent, I think, also is interesting. Um, Californians don't have that like <clears throat> identifiable way of talking. Yeah. Um, but I lived in California. I've lived in Texas, uh, in Austin. I've lived in Kansas. Uh, I've lived in South Carolina and now Tennessee, um, and I've never felt like anybody looked down on me for where I was from. Maybe nowadays, because there's such an exodus from the West Coast, uh, California is crumbling because of its own laws and policies. So people are looking for that m more um, down home feel like less urbanized uh don't you think rachel oh yeah like, definitely less cosmopolitan yeah it's yeah. very it's really different now because like i moved from here where i'm from in michigan to dallas texas in 1998 so that's you can tell how old i am when i say that but uh when i moved to dallas people immediately knew I wasn't from there because the Michigan accent and the Texas accent are like opposite. And we talk fast here and I'm a fast talker anyway. I'm little, 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 little. And then I went to Texas and people couldn't understand me. So it was like, it's hard for them to understand me as it probably is for you. Like you probably have to kind of listen a little bit hard just because I'm speaking English. Um, and people would immediately know I wasn't from there and they would make comments and call me a Yankee and stuff like that. But now I feel like, uh, I feel like now if I moved to like rural Texas and told them I was from the rural Midwest, they would probably think that was pretty cool. They'd probably be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because culturally we're kind of the last bastion bastion. If you look at like our election maps, all the coasts and where the big cities are, are blue. And then everything in between that is red. So we have like this really big divide between urban progressives and rural conservatives. Um, and that's why you're always hearing talk about like, should certain places secede or are we going to have another civil war? And I don't think that that necessarily applies in the digital age in that way. But yeah, there's like... Um, there's distinctly different cultures in our country now. So I think anyone should come here and experience it for themselves. And it's so funny. You hear Britain or people from Britain don't want to come here because they think it's dangerous. Yeah. And they think it's like the wild west. Like everyone has a gun and they're all shooting. Up <laughs> <with it. laughs> but you, you have to come and see how nice people are and how welcoming. Like not – I've been to several countries and not all of them are welcoming to travelers. But – America loves yeah foreign people. We do. <laughs> they will, like spoil you, they'll be into you, they'll ask you to speak your language for them. They'll, you'll have a grand old time. I I love America. Every time I get back from traveling, I'm so relieved 
um, just to be home. And even the last time, like I high fived the uh, guy walking off the plane just because I was so happy to be home. And you hear about all of these like great things that other countries have, like socialized health care. I don't think that's so great. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of good things about America, but like our our overseas policies, like our um, putting bases everywhere and yeah. the oil and just all of this stuff. Like you have to realize this is a small cult that controls yeah things and even what you learn about america is controlled by a very small cabal of wicked people yes <laughs> yes so. and the vast majority of normal americans we are not like uh trying to establish a world empire you know what i mean like most of us don't mm -hmm. want to be in all the different wars and you know it in everyone's business trying to police the entire world like i would say most normal americans are against that that's like the like jamie said it's the small group of elites who run everything who want to impose that on the whole rest of the world whereas like fourth of july which is our independence day every year at my house we go swimming because i have a pool we grill a bunch of burgers and steaks and we uh, shoot skeet with our shotguns and we do fireworks and all that stuff because we are out in the country. We can kind of do what we want. And I guess that's a little bit of the, like the Liberty loving side of America, which has its drawbacks, but isn't all bad. You know, there, America has so many great things about it. And then there are some things about our founding that kind of have made things inevitably not turn out great for us. It's a very mixed bag, but I think like the average American person, we're, we're pretty nice. We're pretty friendly. And we just um, don't identify with our ruling class at all. When yeah. Well, like she normal said, Americans don't, uh, we don't relate to our ruling class at all. Like she said, we're the beta testing ground of all of the yeah. worst things. So that's why you have all the like the fat people at Walmart and all the things that people uh, Europeans make fun of yeah. America for. You have to have mercy on them because for one, they have no idea that everything that they're eating is poison. Yeah, you know, uh, soda, chips, all, all of our food has additives in it that are banned in other countries that make you uh, dumber and less healthy um, and they make you want to continue to eat it so they specifically engineer our food to make it hyper palatable so that it's very hard to stop eating it yeah and that's all there is especially in urban areas for a lot of people that's all that there is like there's not farmers markets and like fresh food everywhere and stuff like that so it's very interesting because here in Poland we are very much as an ever average citizen is a very much pro-American, but in the meaning of being pro-Atlantist, let's say, and I'm personally not very much into this agenda being critical towards this foreign politics of USA. But on the other hand, when I was talking with my last guest, uh, I was criticized because ah, oh, you are talking to Americans, and this is like this once again this false di dialectics here in Poland for criticizing this foreign policy of USA, you can be called pretty easily an Russian agent. And I'm personally much are much more sympathizing with the US culture, just maybe because of the fact that it's so common when you are a child, you are thinking these categories and you love these actors. And this is part of your life. I love some of uh, U.S. writers, like, for example, Nathaniel Hawthorne. He was my favorite author for many years. I love Edgar Allan Poe, etc. Uh, but I'm really glad to hear this from, uh, from you. Uh, I want to ask uh, concerning this picture of uh, both sexes. I mean, uh, women and men, of course, not, not more of them. Uh, do you think that uh, this is like a serious agenda being pushed uh, to present those sexes in one way or another? I see it's changed a lot uh, since uh, 60s or 70s. For example, in these old James Bond movies, uh, the role of sexes was very different. Uh, the old Bond were was uh, brutal, very harsh towards women. I don't think that's uh, like 
Do you think that it was like the true picture back back then and it changed or it was the different agenda in these older movies? Do I think James Bond has more respect for women now than he did? Yeah. And uh, is it reflecting the change in the mentality that really occurred? Yeah, but I, then again, I think we kind of peaked because things were going in a really bad direction with like Rachel brought up incels, um, uh, like the Andrew Tate and those kinds of game guys. Yeah, pickup artist. Guys. Yeah, it's it's getting weird. It's well, I, I think that so James Bond, you may or may not know that... Uh, Ian Fleming, who wrote the Bond novels, was in intelligence himself. And those were propaganda films. But I think what they would do is glamorize it. it the Bond films glamorized this like transnational lifestyle and this like uh, pickup artist type of man. Um, whereas the normal American, so if, like say we're talking about the 60s. The average man in America in 1960s was nothing like a James Bond. He was probably getting up every day and going to like a job at a Ford factory, you know, helping build cars, or he was a janitor at a high school, or he was working in an office somewhere and just trying to pay his mortgage, trying to support his kids, trying to um, keep up with the Joneses, that kind of thing where it's like, Oh, I want to, I want to have enough money for a family vacation and to retire someday and, and keep my family together. And that's like what the normal man was doing. The average American man was not some like suave playboy who was just with a different woman every night at all. Um, so no, I don't think that that was reflective of like the average American man, but I think that that was glamorized purposefully in a way. I've what never the... oh. things that get represented on television are so far from what I've ever seen. And the internet too is even worse. Like nobody has ever spoken to me to my face the way that they've commented on my videos. Exactly. And, and they wouldn't. I believe I, I I totally believe that if that person was sitting across the table from me and had watched my thing and they want to comment something terrible. If they were looking at my face, they wouldn't do that. Yeah. So it's a really weird way of viewing the world, uh, this, these parasocial relationships that we have, um, because no one's ever abused me like that in, in real life like they have on the internet. Yeah, and there's something that I've noticed that happens to both Jamie and I, because like you said, we have these sidekick husbands that um, have big shows um, who are kind of like e-celebs. And... Um, I'd say both of our husbands are what you would call more traditionally masculine. Um, but obviously both Jamie and I are intelligent women. We uh, chose them because we think they're great and we would not be with them if they treated us badly. But I think both of us get a lot of comments where it's like people assume they make wild assumptions that our husbands treat us in some kind of demeaning way or some kind of bad way, which is so strange to me. I don't, I don't know where that impression comes from because I see the comments on her videos and then I see the comments on, you know, videos I'll do with my husband. And I'm like, I don't know where people get that. But again, like she said, I don't think they would ever say it to us in person, but for some reason they feel totally justified making wild assumptions or accusations on social media about that. And I don't know if that's like a, I don't know if that's like a jealousy issue or if it's like people just like to create drama. I'm not sure what that's about, but we both get some pretty crazy comments that, yeah, we would not get in person. So how do you see the dynamics of change of image of women in movies? What do you feel how do you feel about, for example, the movie? How do you feel about Mary Monroe as a person and the way she's depicted in movies? Jamie, well, you go on that one. Oh, well, that's an interesting <clears throat> sub case subject because she was, um, according to our research, one of the first monarch 
public monarch mind control victims. So she had been through a lot of trauma in her life to make her a certain way. And I don't know if you've um, or your viewers have delved into this at all, but it's called beta sex kitten programming. And to make women, you know, more sexualized because that is a bad idea <laughs> for people. But her personal persona, as far as I've read, and her movie, you know, sex pot um, <clears throat> idol persona were a lot different. And that happens to a lot of actresses, I think, because they have to go through these rituals and um, gatekeeping by people who practice magic and work for the deep state. You know, she was involved with JFK and with his brother so and with Hugh Hefner. Um, I don't know exactly what your question was. Oh, what, what was the difference between her screen persona and her real persona? How, uh, how do you feel about the way she was depicted in this movie? So she was like rather silly being considered as a, this uh, sexual symbol. And this is not the pic well, I guess it's changed. It changed. Uh, the women are not presented in that way. And how does it change in your perspective? How do you feel about it? I think women have a lot more different roles now than they were typecast for in the past. Uh, and that's, you know, for good or bad, women are like shown as action heroes now. I don't mm -hmm. think you would have ever seen that in Marilyn Monroe's day. So mm -hmm. her her thing was like the blonde bombshell with not a lot going on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> which was very different from what she was actually like in real life. But now you have all, you know, women represented in all sorts of roles and, you know, for better, for worse, if they're masculine or whatever, it's a lot more variety in Hollywood than there was back then. Yeah. I think that um, in some ways we've gone from one extreme to the other. That's where point. you had, like, like you said, it's she, I've read a lot about Marilyn Monroe and she was trained by like Lee Strasberg and they kind of trained her. Like she would talk about how they trained her to make her top lip do a certain thing when she was talking or to, how she would look like she was looking off into space like an airhead when she would talk like they they specifically trained her in her acting to be like empty headed silly bimbo but then with and they would exaggerate her sexual characteristics like pretty crazy for the time like even for the time it was very like overly exaggerated and now i feel like we almost have an opposite of that, which is like every woman in a movie now has to either be an ass kicking chick who can take out 10 green berets while she's eating a hot bowl of soup, or she's like a single mom rocket scientist, right? She's like a, a brave single mom who's like a rocket scientist who's going to stop the asteroid from destroying all of humanity. And um, if we have sexuality now in the movies, it's usually like the woman is using her sexuality to trick the bad man or whatever. So it's like we've it's like we've gone from one extreme to the other in a way. Um, and I don't like Jamie said, it's hard to tell if that's like good or bad or otherwise. I don't think. But one thing I will say is you don't see a lot of good moms or devoted wives or uh, godly women or anything like that portrayed in the movies very often at all in either, really in either one, maybe a few more, like you could go back to like, it's a wonderful life. And they had like some, some really good virtuous women in some of the older movies, but now virtuous women are almost portrayed as like uh, naive, foolish, uh, controlled, weak, that kind of thing. Um, well, to be fair to America, though, we do have a growing um, platform called Pure Flix. So if you oh, don't yeah. want, like, your typical Hollywood, um, you know, sex and violence, there's a whole industry 
about family values. I mean, it's corny, of course, yeah. because family values are corny, but yeah. you know, it's not sexy and polished like Hollywood, but it's a whole streaming service called Pure Flix where you can watch a movie about any, you know, real world family drama that you want that has like positive uh, message. And even the guy from um, Lord of the Rings stars in one of them. Wait, which uh, guy? Uh, Sean Astin. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're getting more and more big stars or people whose careers maybe are on the decline are making, you know, Christian family value movies. And they're really popular. I mean, like millions and millions of subscribers. So it's like people don't want the gross stuff. It's just being shoved down our throats. Yeah. I remember, <clears throat> I remember from my childhood TV shows like Seventh Heaven, maybe, or or even Desperate Housewives. This was like this, like the last one, very popular and rather wholesome show. Well, I don't know. Do you remember this? Yeah, Seventh this Heaven. Is funny you brought that up because the dad from that show actually got in trouble for being a creeper. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's one of those like false wholesomes. Because okay. they're trying to sneak things in that is not actually wholesome, like pretending or practicing kissing on your brother and things like that. Like that was in the show. That was in the very first episode, actually. Do you remember that show, Rachel? I I don't remember watching a lot of TV around that time, but it's because I I started having babies when I was 20 and after that it was like I was watching Dora and Veggie Tales all the time <laughs> for the longest time. So I missed out on like large swaths of pop culture from like 2000 on. Um and then in high school I was a big music dork so I didn't watch a lot of TV. I was just always listening to music but so I don't remember. I know of it. Like there's a ton of shows that I know of them and I could probably even tell you who some of the cast is but I never really watched the show i asked about Marilyn monroe because well i imagine women watching this uh popular movies from this epoch and how do you feel uh, ashamed of the way she's portrayed and how like culture used women at the time uh, because this what is like this evolution of this procedure uh, have to be somehow empowering and i think that well it's not fulfilling its role but are you somehow uneasy watching this old movies from 60s or 70s there i actually is. love them <laughs> i grew up with my grandparents like i was raised a lot more with my grandmothers one of whom was born in 1918 and the other was born in 1926 and is still alive she's 96 years old today or 1928, I think she was born. So I grew up watching movies from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and I really loved them. And if you go back and watch those movies, there's some good gems, even in the Marilyn Monroe movies. Like there was one called Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And in that movie, it's her and it's Jane Russell. And Jane Russell is the brunette, right? And she's she's the funny, like witty one. And Marilyn Monroe is the hot, stupid one. And um, she's she's dating a millionaire's like son and she's a gold digger, right? She's like a gold digger archetype. And there's a point near the end of the movie where the, the millionaire's dad confronts her and he says, hey, it's been brought to my attention that you are a gold digger and you're after my son and you only want him because he's rich. And she she looks at him and she says, aren't you funny? Don't you know that a woman being pretty is just like a man being rich? And he goes, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, your son doesn't love me just because I'm beautiful, but my goodness, it helps, doesn't it? She said, it's the same thing with a man. Why wouldn't I want a man who's got money? What's wrong with me, you know, wanting that? And he looks at her and he goes, they told me you were stupid, but you don't sound stupid to me. So like, even in those movies, even in those portrayals, I think there were some little gems and some some good things. Hollywood has been co-opted and like controlled from the beginning, but there was some redeeming qualities of those old movies that I actually really love. And there's plenty of, um, I think there's plenty of stories from that time period that don't portray women as just like totally dumb. I don't think it's like wholesale useless women. There's, there's other movies where there's like 
good moms or brave women who, you know, tell the truth or do something courageous. And so like, I don't have like a view of that time period as being like demeaning towards women, but maybe that's not typical. I don't know. What do you think, Jamie? Uh, there's a funny Saturday Night Live character that Kristen Wiig does. Do you watch that show, Saturday Night Live? Sometimes. Okay. So she does the, yeah. like, the, the Marilyn Monroe, like, Ugh. and it's just so <laughs> over the top, but it's hilarious, but it's just, it's, it's a character. Like nobody acts like that. And if you did yeah. act like that, you would, people would be looking at you like you're ridiculous. Yeah. You know, and so. I feel like my grandma would have because like when my grandma tells me stories about like when she was young, it sounds like this. It doesn't sound like that much has really changed because she'll tell she'll be like, oh, my sister was friends with this girl. And boy, she was she was a hussy, you know, and she was running around town trying to get everybody's boyfriend. Like my grandma will tell stories that sound like a lot like now where it's like you had good women and you had crummy women and you had nice men and you had bad men and you had like all the different stereotypes still existed. Um, I know that like Hollywood portrays women from that time period a little differently and they're, but I mean, even like gone with the wind. Okay. That movie was made in the thirties and it's not like Scarlett O'Hara was some kind of like helpless bimbo right and the other women in that story weren't either like melanie was a virtuous woman maybe a little bit on the naive side but virtuous and so i think like from that time period there are other portrayals other than just sex kittens but that is kind of where the sex kitten thing came from jamie's correct about that for sure with the the beta programming that was like a programmed archetype um, but they, I mean, there was sexualization of women, even in the silent films, there was oh, yeah. some goofy but stuff going on there. They do use Marilyn Monroe a lot in the monarch programming that we see today. Like, um, all of the stars have to, or the ones that make it to a certain level are seen doing a Marilyn Monroe photo shoot yes. or a movie or some type of homage to her because mm -hmm. of this, uh, beta programming, I think. Mm -hmm. Another very influential part of culture is, of course, Disney. Disney, And I know that Jamie is very much into this stuff, like analyzing it. So uh, how could you, uh, in a couple of words, explain what's wrong with Disney, which is a great part of uh, life of many people here in Poland? What's wrong with Disney? Um... Hold on, let me get my notes. I have like this whole thing. Wait till you can answer. Yeah, so she, Jamie knows all about Disney. We've talked a little bit about Disney um, in some of the I shows. I personally, I, I admit I don't like it and I never liked it, even when I was a child. But I see many people having these recollections from the childhood are very much into this. And I don't really get what is this, like, the root of this phenomenon. Why people are so much in love with these cartoons? Well, I think it started with them doing like fairy tales, right? Like back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, it was a lot of fairy tales and the animation was very charming. But because it became so popular, uh, it began to be used as a propaganda tool. And Jamie knows the whole history of it and how um, Disney did like wartime propaganda for the government and, and all kinds of things. And then later got involved with like intelligence operations and stuff. So, well, basically it's the most sophisticated propaganda machine that the world has ever seen. Um, it's the biggest multinational conglomerate of uh, the spreading of ideas and philosophies and all the things that we've been talking about tonight um, to literally enchant people by using their imagination and turning it against them and getting their hooks into them at a very young age so that you have a generational um, control because it, it, it's a, by now it's been what, like three or four generations that have been raised on Disney and Disney ideals and propaganda. Yeah. So <clears throat> not a lot of people know that it was co-opted in World War II right after Pearl Harbor bombing 
the U.S. government went to Walt Disney Studios and said, this is ours now and all of our money and, uh, is going to be poured into the production of making propaganda films and training films for soldiers in the war. Um, so you can watch all of these. It's called Disney on the Front Lines. If you look at them on YouTube, so you've got like Donald Duck teaching people how to pay their taxes. You've got Minnie Mouse saving her bacon grease so they can make ammunitions. Uh, it's the subversion of innocence and turning people's um, opinions to what they want them to be through, you know, an innocent art form like cartoons. So Disneyland is a, um, a mind control center, I think, in my opinion. It was built by um, people who Walt consulted with, with the Stanford Research Institute, who is big on mind control and mind control experiments. Um, it was created with the Office of Naval Research and DARPA. They, and the CIA built Disney World. Um, and they all got together to determine the best location of the park based on occult um, information, like ley lines. So it gets really crazy. I mean, I have three books on that Disney runs through all three of them. So I don't know, like specifically, you want to talk about the parks because those are all military industrial advertisements. Have um, you been there uh, actually to this? Uh, yeah. 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 I used to be a tour guide in LA. So uh, one of the stops on my tours was Disneyland. And so, you know, twice a week, I'd have to sit there for eight hours a day and try and figure out what I'm going to do while these people on my tour are, are enjoying the indoctrination of the park. <laughs> Is it so, fun to be there? Yes and no. It's surreal and creepy and it is a fun day. Like if you know what you're doing. Um, I, every time after I learned all this stuff that I went there, it was kind of like, you know, undercover trying to take pictures of secret things and figure out like what's going on here and really. Um, so in the way that I felt like a detective, yeah, it's fun. To go to Disneyland. <laughs> Have you caught something really interesting, really secret? Um, yeah, actually, the if you go on Thunder Mountain Railroad in California, there are um, props that they put as you're going down the waterfall, and it's all about Masonic lore, and the boxes say HOBS Working Tools. And I actually had to get a picture as we were like going down the waterfall. I'm like, that's a compass and square. And that's like a Masonic th plum or whatever that's called. But they have their little Easter eggs hidden in there. Um, Club 33 is a big um, yeah. one that pe a lot of people know about just because it's like the, the most exclusive thing you can be a member of at Disneyland. And of course, 33 is a Masonic number. Yeah. Okay, and the second one, this Nickelodeon, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. Once you mentioned that... Oh, Nickelodeon. It's, yeah, the, it started like a peep show. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us uh, more about this and what is all about this uh, channel? It's not that popular in Poland, I think. Maybe it is, maybe I only don't know about it. But then many stars are coming from this media. So a Nickelodeon was something that they came up with like uh, in <clears throat> the turn of the century on the East Coast. And it was, you know, when they were starting to develop like pictures, cameras and, and stop motion animation, things like that. So it's like a, a picture that flips and you can see it moving. Right. And there's light behind it and you go inside a booth and you pay a nickel. And these turned into be like little pornographic scenes, you know, little belly dancing of of the turn of the century you know not right. not hardcore but like belly dancers and ladies with scarves and stuff like that um but they were known for being you know low class being at like places like coney island and carnivals that sort of feel so yeah nickelodeon was like a little mini peep show and now it is a uh children's cartoon network or not just cartoons, but it's a whole network. And mm -hmm. their logo is green slime that splooges on kids. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In the 80s, when I was growing up, like, there was the mo one of the most popular shows was You Can't Do That on Television. And yeah. they would dump uh, green slime on kids. Well, 
over the years it became different colored slimes, but it was always dumping slime on kids' heads. Um, but it's it's very similar to Disney in the propaganda, and especially in the last 20 years, it's become like there's been multiple scandals. There's um, a couple of the stars from different Nickelodeon tween shows. So like a tween show would be like a show that's really popular with maybe kids between like 10 and 15 or something. Um, and there's been a lot of really popular shows like iCarly or um, Sam and Cat, some different ones that even my kids watch here and there. And it's turned out that there was creeper stuff going on, um, that a lot of these kids have been exposed to some pretty traumatic experiences behind the scenes, um, that there's a lot of, it's very similar to like what we see with Britney and what we see with Disney as far as like control, ritual abuse. Um, it's like they will recruit these kids in and then once they're in, it's like they're owned you know what I mean? So, and then the shows are used to disseminate propaganda. So like in, in the shows, I think Sam and Cat and iCarly, there was tons of feet stuff all the time. And uh, viewers noticed this, like that there was constantly like jokes about feet and showing of feet and all like really absurdly a big amount of like showing these kids feet. And it turned out that uh, one of the producers or maybe even the director I don't remember turned out that he was doing some creepy stuff behind the scenes that had to do with feet with these kids and now some of the stars have come out and talked about that but these tend to just become like little propaganda mills where there's a lot of money there's a lot of fame and so people will do anything to get their kids into this industry and on these shows and the parents can be pretty easily co-opted to go along with certain things, or maybe they look the other way and stuff like that. So, and it, it promotes a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now. And then we also see this phenomenon of child actors, the minute they become adults being like hypersexualized. So that happened with Britney. It happened with Miley Cyrus. It happened with even like um, Shirley Temple and Judy Garland would talk about that kind of stuff going on in Hollywood way back when, but uh, Disney and Nickelodeon both tend to do that where it's like, especially the girls, but even the boys, even a lot of the boy stars end up going down a really dark path the minute they become adults. And same thing with the girls where it's like, oh, I'm 18. So now I'm a sex kitten. They always have to come out and be like really hypersexualized as after if, being a child star. As if this is the only path that adulthood <clears throat> has. Right. Like, they're trying to you know, um, put their child persona to rest and come out as a, a adult celebrity. And the only way to do that is to be hypersexual, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, and then most of the people who look like they're the most affected, like Britney Spears, um, Lindsay Lohan, they were all mouseketeers. So you can yeah. almost like trace the trajectory of the path of like a young Disney child and you know it's not going to end up well for them in the end. Yeah. Was Cartoon Network I think uh, in the USA because I remember it from my childhood and w one of the most traumatizing f things experienced in my childhood was to see this cow and chicken or something, something like this. Do you have any idea why these cartoons are such mm, just filled with this kind of like demonic imagery? Why they are so twisted and so unsettling? This the, because I didn't find any kind of analysis of this uh, matter in your materials. Do you think this is, like contrived for this very purpose of traumatizing kids because it's just so apparent? Yeah, in my um, book, Weird Stuff Part 2, I talk about Land Before Time and how that was such a traumatizing event in my life because I watched the little dinosaur's mom die. So yeah, cartoons are a big part of inserting trauma into a kid's life who wouldn't know about those things otherwise. So it's uh, making them grow up way too fast. Now they know about death. Now they know about witches. Now they know about evil. Now they know about like the dark side. Uh, through cartoons, things they shouldn't even be exposed to. Now they have all these questions about it. Yeah. 
Um, there's a few different Cartoon Network shows that were iffy when my kids were small. But as they got older, now it's to the, I mean, I'd say starting maybe eight, seven, eight years ago, Cartoon Network just became totally unwatchable. We just didn't have it on in our house anymore because like they were among the first to be really blatant with like the transgender stuff and promoting that. Um, and there were, there were some pretty weird, like courage, the cowardly dog is, a. I mean, you could probably do a whole analysis on that cartoon from Cartoon Network. Very creepy, very like occultic, very dark, very strange. And I think with cartoons, they can get away with a lot, right? Because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it's just a cartoon. It's just a, mm -hmm. because you can... You can do things you can't do with like actors. You can portray things you can't do portray in like a, a real, you know, live action type of a show. So I think in cartoons, they can sneak in lots more symbolism, lots more iffy content. And I don't know how much of that is on purpose, but it, it would seem to be just because there is so much of it, just because so much of it tends to be that way. And I think, um, we know that there's like this vegan agenda going on. We know there's like this big push to get people to eat vegan industrialized food to control the food supply because that's been a form of psychological warfare and, and just warfare in general since the beginning of time is control of the food supply. So I think that anthropomorphizing animals from a really young age and, and making it seem to people like animals are just cuddly humans, right? With big eyes and pretty eyelashes and human feelings. So like Bambi was, I was traumatized mm -hmm. by like Bambi when I was a kid, right? Cause Bambi's mom gets killed at the beginning. And then there was like Benji the dog, same thing. It's always like the, the animal becomes orphaned at the beginning, right? And that's the basis of the story or like the Lion King is that way. So there's like recurrent themes in these animal cartoon movies that that seem to repeat over and over and maybe it's a formula for success or maybe it's, maybe there's some symbolism there that they're trying to, trying to get across on a, like a subliminal level. I'm not sure. Part of the cult, the cartoon agenda is um, part of the Aeon of Horus, like the infantilization of adults and Americans are really guilty of that. Like just yeah. wanting to live like children mm -hmm. and, in arrested development and never grow up and so cartoon networks makes these cartoons for adults yes adult subject matter but it's still a, ch a children's art form if you will and so it attracts younger and younger and i'm thinking of stupid shows like rick and morty like even yeah. adults think this is deep and they're like getting insights mm -hmm. about science and they like are rick and morty fans i'm like you're pathetic you don't need to be watching cartoons but <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, like Rachel said, they can put weirder things and even make them satanic. So, like, did you ever see Pickles? Mr. Pickles? No, Mr. Pickles. Pickles. Yeah. yeah. I've heard, but I've never seen it. Um, and then there was a cartoon called Inside Job. So that one is total revelation of the method. Like, it goes into all the conspiracy theories that float around um, and just kind of lampoons all of them in one cartoon. Or like you think back to like MTV liquid television and shows like Ren and Stimpy or things like that. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And have you ever seen this uh, cow and chicken uh, cartoon? Because this is so bland. bland. Uh, in this show, you have this uh, sibling. One is cow and the second is chicken, which is surreal. The entire show, the aesthetics is twisted and really ugly. But they have friend, and this friend is a man, is a red demon. It's just like the outright representation of demon with horn, and he's called a man without trousers, like he's going naked. And it was like in this normal cartoon destined for children. And well, it's hard to be more um, open with uh, this sat satanic agenda when you have this like pedophilia being represented, like. Yeah. plainly in this cartoon and as you said you can do whatever you want with cartoons because it's not being treated seriously it's, it's mm, 
Yeah, it's like that uh, Powerpuff Girls had the yeah. demon that was like trans that dressed like dressed like a hooker. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that show had some crazy stuff in it too. But yeah, it's like you can get away with it because normal people are going to be like, oh, it's just a cartoon. You're being ridiculous. You know, they'll almost get upset with you if you point out that this is really sick stuff. They'll be like, oh, it's just a cartoon. Uh, don't be like that. You know, people will almost shame you a little bit if you say, hey, uh, why are they putting that in a kid's cartoon? Or even SpongeBob. SpongeBob SquarePants has tons of adult humor in it. My husband would watch that when, like, when we were younger. He would watch it and he would look at me like, did you just catch that? And I'd be like, uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's very, it's very easy to sneak stuff into cartoons and kids shows because decent people don't want to believe that that's intentional, you know? They want to think, oh, no, you're just taking it that way or you're just twisting it. They wouldn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, SpongeBob had an episode where they joined the, the lodge or they were like <laughs> bowing down before the all-seeing eye. You remember that one? Yes. Yeah. Um. So he needs the studio in a couple minutes, so I'm going to have to wrap it up for me. Okay. But I just wanted to say um, – I get concerned about talking about this stuff, like, because I don't want, I want the Satanism in America to be exposed, but I don't want the world to think that we are all in right. on this, you know, Satanic agenda. So it's like, it's almost in Germany, like everyone is uh, not a Nazi. I don't know if right. you can say that, right? Not, we're not all Satanists. Like most of Americans are just like good, wholesome, normal people. But all of you see from us is this satanic uh output and i hope that's not going to be used against us in the future like you know if countries invade us in a holy war because of all of the stuff that we put out there or that mm -hmm. hollywood has put out there not us as a people so right like, please separate the propaganda from the actual population yeah that's a very good point and and as we've said multiple times we are like the, we're almost like the primary victims of it because it was pushed on us first. It's been pushed on us and then eventually it gets exported to the rest of the world. But America has been the Petri dish and the canary in the coal mine. And uh, most American people, I can tell you, are, are basically innocent victims of this propaganda. They don't know they're being propagandized with it, which is why Jamie wrote her book. That's why I wrote my book. Because we know that the average person does not understand. You're, you're shown this from the time you're literally an infant. All of it. Movies, pop culture, music, the feminism stuff, everything we've been talking about, you're immersed in it from the time you're a tiny infant. And it's perpetrated on our public by a small group of elites. It's not the American public wanting this. It's just that they foist it upon you and it's all you know now for a few generations. So... Yeah, definitely. It's not something that comes from American people. It's something that comes from a small group of people who control this giant propaganda megaphone. So it's a good point to make. Okay. Do you have time for one more question or is it so you yeah. have to go? That's not a problem for Mason. Okay. Well, so do you have any, any kind of a stereotype of a Polish person? Do you know any Polish? <laughs> figures from history uh, yeah, all I ever heard was, uh, uh, we have we have what are forgive me if I'm being uh, bigoted here but we have what are called Polak jokes <laughs> and they're generally like similar to dumb blonde jokes where it's like oh the Polish person is stupid do you have an example maybe Ah. Uh, you know, my husband would. They're would so know. dumb. It's like, how, how many Polish people does it take to screw in a light bulb or something? Just right. dumb jokes like that. Um, honestly, I just view you guys as normal Europeans. Like, maybe you had a bad time with Germany yeah. <laughs> uh, in World War II. But no, I don't even know any Polish people. And then with Russia... Maybe Brzeziński, he 
No, I mean, no, he was a Paul. Oh, you mean like Z Z Big, Z Big New Brzezinski? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the normal American has no idea who Zbigniew Brzezinski is, but in our little group, he's kind of a villain. Like I would say like me and Jamie and like the people that we work with, we tend to have a pretty negative view of him. Uh, wasn't he Bill Clinton's, uh, he was a Kissinger's guy. He was like bilateral commission. Um, he was a big architect of like the new world order and the their foreign policy and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, he was like in the ring with like Quigley and uh, late Clinton was later. Um, Mika Brzezinski, his daughter is now on um, MSNBC. She does that morning show with Joe. Uh, what's his name? But yeah, um, I'd, I'd say the average American, if you said the big new Brzezinski, they'd be like, who? <laughs> it's funny. Like America's so big. Um, the average American doesn't have time to focus on a lot of geopolitical issues mm -hmm. just because they're focusing on what's happening here. Right. Um, so that's why we don't know, or your, your average, uh, educated, uh, public education child doesn't know a lot of geography of the world and all mm -hmm. the capitals of Europe and stuff, because there's so much to learn just like right here. Yeah. Okay, just to say it openly, I'm not supporter of the politics of Brzezinski. I think that it steered USA in a bad direction and it caused a lot of problems. For example, his support for Mujahideens in Afghanistan yeah. that gave uh, the ground for the rise of radical Islam. Okay, so uh, if you don't have time anymore, well, thank you very much for the time you passed with us. Uh, this is very late night in Poland, but I hope so that some people are going to watch it tomorrow and it will be a couple of thousands on many of our channels in next months. And I thank you from my heart. This is like very special night for me. Uh, excuse me for this little bit clumsy uh, way of uh, doing this interview. And well, see you maybe some time later. And I'm going to be following your materials anyway on the internet. Thank you Thank for you having me and Rachel. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us both on. It's really interesting to be able to be have our stuff exposed to like maybe a place in the world that wouldn't normally get to see what we're doing here. So very, very wonderful opportunity. Thank you.